On behalf of Joanne and Richard, Tony's children, and our entire family, I wish to express my deepest appreciation and gratitude for the overwhelming loving support and prayers that people from around the world have communicated to us in various ways. This love has been a source of great consolation to us in a very difficult time. To Tony's colleagues who have been with him in his professional capacity, to his loyal and exuberant fans, to those who have taken such good care of him and shown so much love to him over the years, we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This Mass is being live-streamed around the world, and particularly to Italy, the land of our ancestry. Joining with us now are the families that our grandparents left behind, never to see again when they made that long, arduous journey to the land of the free and the home of the brave at the turn of the last century. Permit me, if you will, to greet them for a moment in their native language. Volevo prendermi un momento per dare il benvenuto a coloro che si uniscono a questo live stream da tutto il mondo, ma soprattutto dall'Italia. Abbiamo dei cugini che si uniscono a noi appena fuori di Napoli, a Pompei, il luogo di origine della nostra famiglia. A nome del nostro famiglia qui negli Stati Uniti, voglio che tu sappia che ci sei vicini nello spirito mentre ci uniamo in preghiera insieme. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There is no need for me to rehearse for you all of the details of my brother's life, the great changes that took place in its early trajectory when he was younger, that eventually would bring him to the great success that he enjoyed as he matured. For all of that, I refer you to the accounts that have been splashed throughout the media and the major newspapers and online this past week. Besides, it's not the role of a priest in a funeral homily to eulogize the deceased. My role, which I take as seriously as Tony took his role, in his professional capacity as an actor, my role is to communicate to you the love of God that comes to us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, especially when we have to confront death. Death is not the final word in the Christian vocabulary. Life is, eternal life, into which my brother has now entered. Nor is it my role to canonize my brother. For that, I refer you to a higher authority. What I can do, however, is point out to you some dimensions of this man's complicated life that may not be seen or be as obvious, or perhaps to make some connections for you that may be overlooked. And I do this with an aim not merely to celebrate his life, as they say, but to uncover its meaning, and thereby the meaning of all of our lives. Because let us be honest in admitting that in the death of anyone, we all contemplate our own mortality. It is we ourselves who mourn when we mourn for others. The most obvious thing about my brother was the crusty, tough exterior that everyone saw, saw and that he made a living off of. I've likened him to a good loaf of Italian bread. There were a lot of 
reasons for that intense bravado that I need not go into now. It's sufficient to say only that it was there for protection. As many of the professional actors who are here know, people often confuse the actor with the act. When you look beneath that tough defensive armor, as Michael Imperioli called it last night at the wake, you begin to see a softer, gentler interior. My brother had a deep capacity for interior reflection, even if it was coated with that tough protective shell. And that brings me to a second and even more important point that I think we all need to reflect on. Given certain decisions he made, especially earlier in his life, and especially the roles that he would eventually play in a professional capacity, many will be surprised to hear me say that my brother had a moral compass. Let me illustrate this to you by relating a story. It took place on the day of my first Mass, which was celebrated in this church. My parents were married in this church. My mother was buried from this church. My father was buried from this church. And as I just said, I celebrated my first Mass, and now today, celebrate my brother's funeral. On that day, after the Mass, as good Italians, we went off to um, a hall for a big dinner. There were lots of people at that dinner. Lots of food, as you can imagine, in this neighborhood. And as we were having a drink before the dinner, one of our relatives came up, who had been at the Mass, and went up to him and she said, Junior, today was your brother's first Mass. He said, yeah, what about it? She said, you didn't go to communion. He said, I didn't go to confession. And I said to him, Junior, you're the last bad Catholic in America. All the rest think they're entitled to come to communion without that preparation. You know, that revealed to me a seriousness with he, which he had about preparing himself, an awareness of his own incompleteness and the necessity for confession before encountering a holy God. I think that was his redemption. I know many think that the admission of sin or of guilt or of shame or wrongdoing somehow diminishes our human dignity. I see it differently. I think it places a firm foundation under our human dignity because it reinforces our integrity. The gospel speaks of the death of our Lord on the cross. Jesus is described as being crucified between two criminals. The scripture says that Jesus was counted among the wicked. He was always among sinners. That place, Golgotha, was an abandoned quarry. And in a way, those two malefactors on either side of Jesus represent our own capacity, humanity's capacity, to either deny our faults and to rage against those who make them apparent to us, or to reach out and accept forgiveness. Surrounded by scorn on that hill, Christ spoke among his last words, words of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. 
This was not a cheap forgiveness that he was offering. After all, it cost him his life. A few weeks ago, I saw my brother for the last time when I visited him in Florida, where he had lived close to his faithful daughter who tended to his every need in his last days. I sensed that the end was coming. So as we sat in a private location, I pulled out a confessional stole from my pocket and I looked into his eyes and I said, how about that confession? My brother agreed. And I did one of the most significant things that a priest can ever do for another human being. I absolved him of his sins, all of his sins. That good thief about whom I spoke, who is next to Jesus on the cross, is said to have stolen heaven in the last moments of his life. He did not deny his guilt. He admitted it. He did not obfuscate about it or equivocate about it. He simply said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. My friends, if Paulie Walnuts could steal heaven, so can you and I. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.